her by something for me that was helpful, and this ties to a couple of pieces. So she said, we really need to watch our terminology, but this made a connection for me. She said, what do we, what do we mean when we say developmentally delayed versus developmentally young? And, and so uh, one of her comments was common language is really important in how we use it. Because she said parents will get more concerned when we use this term versus this term. But she also said this term implies uh, doing we maybe need to do something different versus it's part of the natural process. So developmentally delayed implies you need a different intervention as opposed to developmentally young could actually equate to um, more time. Yeah. That makes sense? That was an aha uh -huh I had this morning. Um, the other thing that she said is we tied this to her comment to me, and I don't have this data to share with you, but Brian and I talked about the other day is. Uh, at the end of first grade, the reading tra trajectory is set for a kid and how they're going to respond, regardless of what you do. So if we don't have a tra 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 yeah, that trajectory set properly, then this is this is the trajectory that they should be on. If it's if it's this trajectory, we may alter it, but it's never going to cross or, or intersect. So I mean, she's going to give me that information also. So that's kind of where we're at. So what we're going to we're going to move off of this, and um, I want to transition. Um, I would like to just quickly. We talked about the geometry and construction a little bit. That was one of the conversations we had two months ago, and um, Britton sent me a little. This is I uh, fast forwarded. There's just some pictures, but there's just a few little student testimonials about geometry and construction. So I want to share that real quickly with you. This is from Emporia. I thought it was interesting. Yeah, I think it's different because there's more teachers, so you're able to get more hands on things to do what you want. And you're not always sitting in the chair, you're always up and moving around at some point, learning how to use different tools and work with others. So, kind of being in charge of a small group, because you kind of have to be the boss. Like, you can't be shy about it, you can't like stay behind, you have to and it's just your notes. Your notes aren't just by yourself. You're collaborating with the notes. You can help each other on your notes and everything. So. This is, I was, I watched this class one day. There's probably 28 kids, 20 to 30 kids, and probably, I think there's two teachers. There's a construction teacher and a geometry teacher. There's a couple more comments at the end. <laughs> Is that it applies math problems to real world problems that you have in your chaos, but it also allows you in construction to see it actually be used in real world problems as well. I I like the fact that I chose this class because I like the pace of it. Um, I have to take my time, and the construction itself it can be really fun, but you also learn a lot. A lot of things that you really wouldn't have learned um, in just a normal uh, geometry class. Okay, so one thing I've been to do in construction is how to operate a minor saw and how to be confident with it. Um, one thing that I've learned is to climb a ladder because I'm scared of heights and that's like hard for me. And you learn things that you never thought you would learn as in like building a shed. That was a big experience. Like, yeah. It's just a great experience. Yeah. So again, I just thought it was interesting that something we had talked about, that's a program that, that was uh, highlighted. Um, I think Diana said something about it, or Joni said something sure. about it. But it's um, kind of originated out of Colorado. So um, again, that is happening at, an, at Emporia. So um, 
I think they're proud. I think they're pleased with what it's doing. Britton said um, the kids. He really. I think they're starting to do a little tracking with kids' grades. And from what I, and I can't no quote me on this, but I think he told me they're seeing a difference in how those kids are performing on their standardized tests. They were behind, and after taking the class, they actually have caught up with or surpassed um, from the math side the other kids. Max saw the same thing with his kids at Hillsboro. Um, short time frame, so you can't say it's absolutely causal, but the more learning by doing in real world experiences, what happened to your ACT scores? They're going up. They're really hard because they're not applying it. And it's not just sitting there and reading it from a book and working it from a book. I just think, and you probably see that too, Bob. They're, they're just going. And, and the last year was phenomenal. Um, it's 25 days. You know, composite. I need to look at where we are on our PLW in particular, because I know that is such great application. You can see there. I don't know whether you know, but we got the aeronautical engineering. Our kids, when they went through the whole first semester, decided they had a model plan that they instructed a lot, and they flew that, and they had some they didn't like it for so what you do, you build your own from scratch. That's what they're doing. I mean, that's pretty awesome. They have engineers. And, and, it's, and, and they, they designed the wing, they ran through an air tunnel, saw which one gave the best fit, they did all that, and they designed it. How many of you taken those kids to go to ATC? You need to. You know, I'm telling you. That aerospace stuff at Watson. So let's transition to that. Let's transition to 1.4. Hey, one point though about that video. When we handed out the graduation requirements the other day at Soup's Council, the three math credits say you have had algebraic concepts, geometric concepts, and three credits. Can I stop you for a second? Yeah, go ahead. I want to know. Because we talked about a little with regard to that. We got a kid that's going to the partner program I'm talking about. What math are you teaching that we need to learn to teach that's not traditional algebra one, algebra two, geometry, that will be that applied math that we can end up with giving the three required credits ever we do? And, and I think it was James over here that made a great statement. We're trying to fit the right system. Stand. We have, we're trying to fit the system rather than, for instance, we can say right now we can go in and we can teach residential carpentry and we can take a math teacher in there and say, yeah, that, that's this concept, yeah, they have that concept. And he's saying, why the hell do we have to do that? If they're going to end up with a certificate, they're going to end up with a job, they're going to be a carpenter. Why do we have to all of a sudden say, well, we got to bring the math teacher in who says they met this? Well, then they didn't pay. I'll answer that as a former carpenter's instructor. Yeah. You know, I'll answer it the way I thought. You start, you know, if you're teaching teaching carpentry, usually it's easy to gravitate towards a job site where you're going to put a building, and and then from there you're you're really teaching estimating every day that you're in the classroom because you're you're going from the ground up all the way to the finished product. So and they're crappy at that, by the way. So, that's really so, good. so you know, you're going to start. You're going to start with your site, and you might have to. Uh, you know, you're going to teach the, the the skills that are frustrating to an instructor. The students don't have their basic arithmetic, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. That's going to be a problem. But you can quickly go to say the job site, and you're going to teach uh, excavation. And you're going to talk about excavating a flat surface, and you're going to talk about volume of dirt that you're removing from a hole. And then you're also going to talk about uneven surfaces, how you average those, and you work with ratios and things like that. And then, then you're going to move into putting in the footings, and you're, you're talking a new formula, cubic feet, and you're you're talking about estimating for concrete. And you've got that in the footings and the walls. And then and then you get into the floor framing and, and the wall framing and the roof framing. And, you're, you're doing estimates on not only 
per stick or per piece of lumber, but you're also doing estimates that are common in the industry that relate to waste and ratios and other factors that you need to consider. You know, for example, how do you estimate drywall for a building? And so you're, you're starting to get into those estimates and, and those, those acceptable principles that are done in the trade. Of course, nowadays, <coughs> There, there's a lot of estimating software, today. but the short answer to that is you're going to be doing the basic arithmetic, but you're also going to have some opportunities to get into right angle trig at a fundamental level. You've got stairs, you've got roofs, all that, all that kind of stuff. And the key to it is to make it craft based where each student gets every assignment. And you're not just Supporting the all stars with the advanced work while you're treating them. Around, you, know, that you take time to pull off of the job site and have every student in the class at one by four, and every student plays out a rafter, or every student plays out a stair, you know, on a piece of scrap plywood or whatever. But that, that's, it's, a, it's a math class, and it, it's a tremendous opportunity to really put application. That, that was my approach. Well, okay. Do you have this set up? Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I think I think carpentry teachers teach mathematics formally and informally every day. Also, engineering. Yes, they do. Okay, there's an engineering class. Yeah, but if you know you're you're it's an estimating class alongside a hands-on construction class, it's, you've got to uh, you've got to know how much materials you've got to have on site, and, and you've got to know when it's all the costs now. So it, it wouldn't be to me that would not be difficult to interview a carpentry instructor and ask them what kind of math they teach when they teach it. And, you know, they're they're going to teach it in each phase. And, you know, if you talk about the site preparation phase, you, could, you could say, okay, we're going to identify the math that we're doing at site prep. We're going to also identify math that we do with the prep. So yeah, it's a great opportunity to add content. Hey, um, let's take a second. I, do any, how many of you know Sherry UK? She is the president Hi, Sherry. of Wichita Area Technical College, and we invited her to join today. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear us okay? I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Perfect. I apologize for joining in late, but I had a meeting in my room. Gail, if you'll go around with the camera. You know Steve Porter from Hutchison Community College. Hi, Sherry. Um, you know Max. You met Max. Um, we were up there last week. When we were there two weeks ago, um, as Gay gets around. Gay, have you been drinking this morning? Don't let the secret out. There you go. Uh, keep going. There you go. Um, that's Bob Deaconbrock, the superintendent at Kingman. Norwich. Hi. Even Norwich. Always forget the Norwich. James Regeer is the superintendent at Remington Whitewater. And over here, uh, let's see, let's get Kevin Case is the superintendent at Inman. Hi, Kevin. Over my shoulder is Tracy Bourne, who is the superintendent at of the Renwick School District. Uh, Ann Dale, um, Garden White. Hello, how are you guys? Good. <clears throat> <clears throat> if you if you guys have not had the chance to visit Wichita Area Technical College, in fact, any of the technical colleges and community colleges, take a tour. It, it is worth the trip. And in fact, um, uh, one of uh, Sherry's uh, people invited us to hold this session at Wichita Area Technical College. They have a conference room that looks right down into uh, one of the classrooms with 10 airplanes in it. That's that's pretty impressive. But um, sure, we'll just let you join in. Kevin is leading the conversation, and feel free to jump in at any time. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate it. Well, Sherry, I think you're based upon the conversation that Steve and I had. I think I think your timing's uh, I think your timing's good. So really, uh, I think since we have Steve and you both here, uh, I think I think where we'd like to go, uh, we're kind of on the agenda. We're kind of in the, uh, I have listed basically some conversation. We have stackable credentials, uh, certificate, industry certification programs like the 10 week programs, um, and the absence of general ed courses in some of those. And then 
small successes uh, lead to more. So in other words, when those kids are able to get uh, a 10 week credential, what are you seeing in terms of them being able to stack more on top of that or their success rate? And then there was one other thing um, that Steve shared with me. I think he was gonna see if you had a graphic form of it or a, a, a source to cite, but something to do with what percent of Kansas kids- uh, Attend public post-secondary institutions. And and Jerry, you, you shared with us, uh, you didn't give us the, the source on that, but um, percentage of kids, high school graduates in Kansas, who attend a public post-secondary institution. And Sherry, I think you said that percentage was 56%? Yes. And then what percentage of that 56% actually complete their post-secondary experience? Uh, let me see, I think I've got that right here. Nothing like welcome to the party. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know that right now, but one of okay. The so uh, this was this was talked about at the at the board of regents meeting uh, this month or last month, I guess. And that what they said was that 54 percent of high school graduates attend a public post secondary college. Uh, and that will taper off three to four percent each year over the next five years. So we're in a downward trend on that? Yes. That's what the research is showing. And I think, I, I'd have to check, Steve. I think that came from the Brookings Institution, but I could be wrong. I would not write it down. But I can ask the people at KBOR because they're the ones that gave that out. Oh, you repeat them. I didn't quite get 54 percent of high school graduates in Kansas attend a public post secondary institution. Correct. And that number is going down. And the estimate is that number will decrease three to four percent over the next five years. And Cherry, you, you shared the percentage then that graduate to complete that post secondary experience is less than 50% of the 54%. 27%. So again, um, having this data, Sherry, what part, of, what part of what we've been talking about is helping boards of education, parents, teachers, uh, educators make connections, and part of that is seeing some of this data and talking about it not just once, not just <coughs> twice, um, I've noticed with our board, we've been talking about this since September, and at our last board meeting, when I showed that gap, um, that we need 33, 35% of our kids need to be getting a certificate or two-year degree, and right now we only have 10% in that category, one of my board members said, that is not accurate. And, and then he said, I want to I want to see our data again, because I want to talk about it again. So. I think what we're trying to do is wrap that data and connect the dots and continue to have that conversation. So if you don't mind, let's transition, maybe you and Steve transition into some conversation about, uh, let's just talk about that, those, those stackable credentials, because I don't know that I totally, I think Steve was starting, I think there was starting to have a conversation on that. Kevin, let me, let me tell you what prompted the thinking, and uh, Max and, and Mike and I went, we visited there, then we went to uh, Washburn Technical Institute uh, three days later and visited there, and I've had a conversation with Steve Porter about this. But let me tell you what became clear to me. Um, we were visiting with one of the instructors at, at WOTC, and that instructor teaches, uh, Sherry, I think it's a 10-week program to train kids, to train students to rivet on airplanes. That's correct. Yeah. I, I don't know about you guys, but when I get on an airplane, I want a riveter that knew what they were doing. Okay, so it's an important job. Now, uh, I think it's probably hard work. I think it's probably boring and tedious. But it's a 10-week prep program. I think those kids start at about $15 an hour. I guess they get a lot of overtime, and they get full benefits. So you're talking about a kid with a 10-week program making $40,000 ballpark with 
in health insurance. Okay? But then one of the conversations we had was this. Um, and I, I'm sorry, I don't remember the instructor, and, and I'm paraphrasing. This isn't exactly what he said. There are no gen ed requirements, and the gen ed requirements are really a stumbling block for some or a lot of kids. And, and it started to hit me that when we talk about never closing an option for our kids to go to college, so we want them all to have the four years of English, including, including literature, algebra one, geometry, algebra two. Uh, you, you follow my train of thought. We're giving them all that curriculum to go to a four, four year school. For those kids that aren't going to be there, we're actually closing more doors than we're opening. And the stackable, the thing that hit me, the instructor was saying, if those kids will go out to Spirit Aircraft, put those rivets in, show up every day, you know, be, be drug free, the big ones, and work hard, that then those companies will pay them to go back. And, and he made an interesting statement that once they have that 10 weeks on campus, they attended college. And now when that kid goes back, they know that they can succeed at college, and it opens the door to get the gen ed curriculum, finish an associate degree, stackable credentials, that then can lead to a bachelor's degree at a, at a regent's institution. And it hit me that stackable credentials actually opens more doors. It gives kids small steps to take versus that idea of, oh, my God, I'm going to go straight to a university. Does that make sense that when that hit me, I'd always been one of those believers you can't close off options for kids. And it struck me we're actually closing off more options by forcing them into a region's qualified admissions curriculum than we're opening. Uh, Steve, your opinion on that. I'll put you on the spot. Well, I, I think it's valid. And I, you know, I think the stackable credential is a great opportunity. In fact, <clears throat> Uh, Kansas, to your post-secondary institutions have had the opportunity to write performance goals uh, that relate to increasing the number of stackable credentials that are available. And you know, Sherry knows a lot about this as well. And I guess I would define a stackable credential as a single course or a list of courses that are less than a degree or certificate, well, less than a degree, that a student would complete, and at the conclusion of that training, they're going to earn an industry credential and they're going to have some employment opportunities. Uh, an example, I'll give two examples. In manufacturing, it might be the manufacturing skills certificate. It's eight credit hours. A uh, student can take that. They can go to, on our campus, they can go to an industrial maintenance mechanics certificate. From that, they can go into automation engineering technology. If they complete the uh, uh, entry level stackable, they can go to a, they can go right to work probably in some kind of a production environment. But if they, as they gain that success and as they earn the certificate and then uh, move on into the AAS degree, they're going to start at 40, 45,000 if they're getting that automation engineering type technology degree as a two year major. What was the first phase of that? Well, the first phase was a short course, such as an eight credit hour. It could be anything, but in our case, the example here would be a manufacturing skills certificate. And once they have that, they can go get a job. Well, and the important, yeah, they could. But the important aspect of that is what they took in that first eight credits is going to count in the next certificate that's 17 credits. And what they took in the 17 credits is going to count at the next level in the 64 credit hour degree. But when we say stackable, you're not starting over. Yeah. You're, you're accumulating and stacking. In the allied health area, it could be something as simple as starting as a CNA, completing the nurse aid, then moving to the med aid, and then maybe they're moving into the LPN, and then they're moving on into the RN, or maybe they're moving into the respiratory therapy assistant or physical therapy assistant, and similar earning power and similar, you know, well above twenty dollars an hour starting out. So those are those are examples of stackable. But the key to it is it can be a single course or it can be a list of courses. They all count and they keep counting. And, and Sherry may have some Can other definitions, because that's how I've kind of set stackables in my mind. And it, it's a tremendous opportunity for students that um, don't, and, and we're, we're not cutting off 
or limiting students by saying you shouldn't get a four-year degree. We're saying do this right now. Yeah. Here's another path. Be, yeah. a four-year degree. Be employed while you're going to college or yeah. get into employment for a few years and let that hold you for a few years until you're ready for that next uh, challenge. And, and Steve, when we got done, I asked Max, I said, as a high school principal in Hillsboro, did you actually have kids that could not go on, that just weren't going to go on and take the gen ed courses and, you know, even get a two-year degree in your response every year? Yeah. But the direct consent is to develop almost, if we take the term we were using earlier, and use yeah. the term developmentally appropriate. Developmentally young. Or, or developmentally young. Because yeah. some kids, eight hours is going to get them. Because <clears throat> that's really what they're able to do. Once they get that experience well, in those college classes, then they, they I would experience. I would challenge you not to put right. that right. label on this yeah. because I will tell you, and Sherry can attest to this as well, we're getting university graduates in stackable <coughs> credentials because their first degree is not working for them. That's exactly right. They're coming back to the two-year institutions and they are finding a way to become employed in something that is going to make a living. I guess I'm I totally get that. I'm yeah. saying for some of our kids that we don't know if we can get them right. through. I, I'm Both thinking extremes. more younger yeah. kids, Absolutely. but I, I get what you're saying. Yeah. I think the other thing that I would just say about the credentialing is that I completely agree with Steve's definition, um, but I would also say that it creates a it, it creates a pathway where students want to do the work because they're interested. And then it creates self-efficacy in them so that they continue to finish. And I also would contain that stackable curriculum or stackable cur cur curriculum and credentials is probably one of the best ways that we can get away from loan debt. Can you define the stackable credentials? Yeah. Uh, the way I was defining it, it could be a single course, say for example, nurse aid. Or it could be a list of courses that a student takes that's less than a degree that leads to an industry certificate, recognized credential, and employment. You have both the certification and you would also have the employment opportunity at the conclusion of the single course or the list of courses. Some stackable credentials are one course, some stackable credentials might be three or four courses that make up a program. And so in the example of the manufacturing skills, we, Sherry and I both have examples of how that curriculum is taught on our campuses. Uh, but let's just say it's an eight credit hour course. It prepares people to go into machining, welding, and general manufacturing and employment immediately in the production environment. That same eight credits is gonna count on our campus for 17 credit hour industrial maintenance mechanics certificate, which also has immediate employment opportunities. Talking about students leaving early. Yeah, they met a goal, you know. It's okay if they leave early. And then that same 17 credits might count towards their automation engineering technology degree or our former manufacturing engineering technology degree. And so now you've got, maybe you had $15 earning power at the, at the sub-certificate level, at the AAS degree level, you're in 40 to 45 and up uh, starting wage with uh, opportunities for overtime. And we just had this, we just toured uh, several in the high school parents last week, and we had an instructor stand in the automation lab and answered that question directly to those parents. And they wanted to know how much the students were going to make. And he said, he could tell you by name, <clears throat> you know, he gave names of students, and he said, my problem is I don't have enough students. I've got all these high demand jobs, but students don't know what, what the jobs call. We've got to do a better job of getting students into these areas. Machining is metal. Uh, machining, automation, industrial controls, those are some of the examples. But that instructor was able to say, these industries are competing for these people, and they're starting at 40 to 45, uh, 40 to 45,000 years to your degree, with next to little or no debt. Can I ask a question? It seems like. <coughs> Way off. A lot of these are almost like uh, manufacturing jobs. Is that a fair statement? I would say I used an example of manufacturing, but there's lots of examples across the health, health okay. professions. Can we take the manufacturing job, job, which yep. is 
some of the change. I remember it's been six years I've been changing in Norway, so, but uh, we were in some place in Butler County and some of the change village said he can't graduate kids because after one year of learning how to use that equipment, they were getting offered second grade again. That's right. just add to that, that that's you know your point is a good one and that industry is cyclic but manufacturing processes or manufacturing processes whether they're in aviation or they're in agriculture or they're in, um, you know any type, any other type of manufacturing and what we supply for is the supply chain more than we do the big OEMs and so the supply chains have divested themselves. They're creating parts for all kinds of industry across the United States and globally. So I think the I think it's a more recession-proof um, industry manufacturing is more recession-proof than it's been in the past. Uh, and then the other thing I would say to that is, if you are a sheet metal assembly and you go to ten weeks and you can complete that and get fifteen dollars an hour with full benefits. And you can get the benefit of continuing your education. You can go finish your composites fabrication, your composites repair, get your degree, and now you are even more marketable within even a spirit era systems. The other, the other thing I would add is that um, we need to do a better job of identifying and communicating the other types of manufacturing that exist in our region that are not related to piece part uh, assembly or piece part production. There's a lot of process manufacturing in this region of the state, central Kansas, <coughs> central Kansas, that relates to continuous process flow. And it's everything from chemical plants to refineries to uh, plastics and, and uh, food processing and those manufacturers need industrial maintenance mechanics and automation engineers that can work in those maintenance fields to keep machinery running and to work directly with uh, plant engineering. There, there's some tremendous opportunities in, in the process manufacturing environment that uh, they have some of these same skills that embedded inside their, inside their facilities, such as welding and machining and that kind of thing on their maintenance side. But they have a huge opportunity on the on the troubleshooting and industrial control side, and and that's everything from plastics to, to oil and gas and, and and some of these other areas. And so, a lot of times when we think manufacturing, we think of a weldment or we think of a machine part, and that's that's part of it, it's a significant part of it. But the process manufacturing is a, another opportunity, huge opportunity in our. And I think for both of us, we have a, we have wonderful programs and great labs, but we have a lot of uh, unused capacity. Yes. And we have a lot of need in all of these areas of you know of manufacturing and automation, but we do 
funnel of students coming through in order to do that. And if you think for every two that start, one's going to finish, you need a complete amount of people coming into those programs in order to fulfill the need that industry has. There are some great jobs right now out there, and they're being unfulfilled right now in our, in our state. I asked uh, Clark Coco, um, we saw the same thing, that there were classes with four, five, six kids in them, you know, sitting around, and I just asked him off the cuff, what's your unused capacity? How many kids could you bring in here now that you've got classes, you've got seats, I mean, everything, and he said, oh, at least a thousand. I can handle a thousand more kids. Uh, Washburn Institute of Technology. And I'm assuming Hutch has a news capacity. <laughs> yeah, we have we have programs uh, like other colleges where they're selective admissions. Uh, our allied health, for example, most of those programs are selective admissions, and we have waiting lists because a program size is in direct correlation to the number of clinical sites that you can give for that program to support it. But then we have programs on the manufacturing side where we've got great capacity. Uh, where there's no selective admissions and, and the uphill battle is just getting high school kids to understand the opportunity yeah. and, and their parents. And so so I, I appreciated that parents tour the other night because you know we had we had parents from Inman and they, they were in the facilities and they had a chance to look at both manufacturing and allied health. And you know it's it's about educating <coughs> about educating the parents and the students and you know, you, well, how, it, it, to me, it's no secret why a high school kid wouldn't know about machining. If, if a high school student does not have a machining experience when they're in high school, why would they ever know about it? You know, I, I did machining work for about three and a half years between my associates and my bachelor's, and it's because I had a good high school program. And, and so after my associate degree, I fell back on that experience and I pursued that industry for employment because I liked it when I was in high school. But so I mean it's not it's not a real big secret as to why we don't get kids into these. They don't they don't know what it is. And if they don't have it in their immediate town. Steve, I think and they're expensive to start. One of, one of the best pieces of our meeting last month was when you shared your story with our table. And is that too personal for you to share that with the whole group? I, I thought that was fantastic. I don't remember the story, well, but how you, you, just, you just you just started it. How you got from high school to where you are today? Okay, and that that confidence piece you were missing. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, I I came out of high school and I was 17 when I got out of high school, but I had the fortune of going to a high school in Oregon that had a strong technical area, and that's what I always gravitated towards. So when I had to make the decision about staying with band versus going to the wood shop or metal shop or machining. I chose, I had to make that hard choice. I liked the band, but I, I went into the, the, the unit shops. And uh, went off to college, uh, played sports, tried to take as much tech ed as I could. Got out of my associate's degree, and I, I always thought I wanted to be a teacher, but I didn't really have the public speaking confidence, and there were some other things that were missing from my experience. I didn't feel like I had a story I was ready to tell. I didn't feel like I had that expertise. I was ready to share. So I went to the industry and I got a job as a machinist and stayed in the profession at least three years full time and a couple of years part time. And it, it was through that experience that I was able to make those connections when I was back in college for my junior and senior year that I felt I had gained I had gained some credibility and some experience that I had to then share. Uh, part of it was I did training when I was in industry. We did one-on-one -on -one training with people and I really liked teaching. So, yeah, by the time I got out of my bachelor's degree, um, I had a job offer to teach, and, uh, but I needed, I needed to step out for a while to gain some experience and, and specifically some self-confidence about a field that I thought I wanted to be involved in. And so I was in the classroom about 10 years and, and then started pursuing administration. 32 years later, I guess that's where I'm at. Yeah, we, we, of course, I had a larger group last week. I had my high school principal and counselor, but that got us just talking in our district a little bit about sequencing, too. Yeah. And, you know, we, we kind of tend to think, I mean, if we meaning superintendents kind of think, tend to think of four year university rather than like, what's wrong with this route? Right. Nothing. No, I mean, it's wrong with yeah. this route. I was all set to go to Oregon State as a junior. I already 
already had an apartment, but I, but as I was getting ready to go there, I probably would have majored in general business and I wouldn't have known what my business was. And so I just stopped in, in August before, and I just said, I'm not going to go right now. And I got a job. And I think there were people, and this is the message that you get, I think there were people that thought, well, you buy that truck, you buy that motorcycle, you'll never go back to college. You know, you 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 go start making too much money, you won't go back to college. But you know, sometimes you you realize when you're in industry that you have to go back to college in order to be able to advance. And you know, college isn't for everybody, but for me, I eventually found my way back because I wanted more leadership opportunities. And and so that that was kind of that decision zone that I had to make. And I guess the point there is it's okay. It's okay to take your time to, to get that experience. I think sometimes people that work a little while are a lot more focused. And and they might they might actually go to work all five days a week and maybe stay all eight hours or more. And you know, because we always hear that in industry about the workers that don't want to come all five days or six and they don't want to stay all day. For me that it, it worked. It, it worked out fine. But I think there's a compelling part of that story, Steve, and this, the compelling part is is that your interest began in high school. Yes. And I think as, as we look at our high school and our two-year college sector, we have to be figuring out how we work so much more synergistically. Because of funding issues, not everybody's going to have a machining lab and a, and, a, and a welding lab and a composites lab and a this lab and a that lab. But at the but at the but with your post secondary partners, we have all of those things, and so we need to expose those students to that and give them those opportunities, even if they're not at the high school. That that it's that it's part of that experience that they can have by by working with the post secondary people. Jerry, I'm 20 miles north of you. I need to come visit. You I'd love to have you. Hey, can you speak a little bit? You mentioned about the college graduates coming back uh, to your school. Uh, I know they have, that happens with Steve too, but what are the entrance requirements? Do they change any when you have a college graduate return? No, we're open admissions, so there's no, I mean, the entrance requirements are not there. Um, we do with, uh, math, you know, math, uh, a math score, but uh, that's, not a, that's not an issue. No, and we have a lot of adults that come back that are university graduates, particularly in a liberal arts area or a business area, and they come back to be retrained, retooled to go to the workforce uh, in an area of allied health or manufacturing or aviation or whatever it may be. Does that shorten the number of courses they have to take at all? Well, their gen ed courses that they took for their baccalaureate degree apply to their applied science degree, so they just take the technical portion of the program. Because I, my hunch is, I know it happens to me, most all of us on the street corner get asked about that. Yeah. By former graduates who, yeah. But in these short-term programs that start this, you know, stackable curriculum, I always like to look at it like you're kind of building a, a pathway that has multiple entrance and exit points. So you can finish this, get a credential, go to work, or you can continue to build on that to the next part of your academic. You can exit there, go to work, you can continue. So it becomes an, a, a multiple entry and exit point for education and for employment. The, the visit between the discussions with Steve and then visiting Sherry and going to Topeka just really changed our perspective of what's available for our kids. Opportunities are amazing for our kids. Yeah, Go ahead. I, I actually got three three things. I don't want to have to take a phone call. I stepped out, so I'm not sure. I'm glad you mentioned the stackable credentials again because you know we've all probably been dabbling in. Um, the, the health science realm. I know Steve and I did a CNA class in about 19, what, 98? Yeah. Uh, somewhere there. When you were in Burton. 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 Yeah. And uh, it was crazy out there concept, you know, and so we've all been doing those types of things. I would like to know because what, what I hear you say makes sense. 
So I told a story about your student that ended up buying your house and paying it back when you were there. I think that's a neat story. Yeah, I had a uh, I had a student who didn't like me very much. Imagine that. Um, <laughs> she. Uh, just, she this she, is just one. There was just one. Yeah, yeah. one. I'm just going to tell one story. It happened once. But uh, she uh, she really didn't know what she wanted to do. Didn't come. Didn't have a very good home life. And uh, I talked to her and she came back. And she almost got kicked out of the thing, I think, because she was she was pretty wild and wasn't always the, the most studious person. But she got through it. And uh, when I when I left Burton and got got uh, a job in another district, uh, my house was for sale. She ended up buying my house after it sat in the market for like two years because she had a she had a job. And she, the only reason she had a job was because I brought that program. <laughs> Into. So it was a little self-serving, I guess, in, in some respects. But, uh, you know, I, and later on, she thanked me. She said, you know, I, I would not have gotten this certification had, had it not been for you bringing it to school. And so, but I would like to know, if, is there any tracking of data to how many people actually, how many kids actually take advantage of that stackable credential? Because most of the kids that I see Taking my program, we're taking it for a couple reasons. Some of them want, it's the first step to getting the nursing aid or their, their nursing degree. So that would be considered the stackable side. Some of them are taking it because they want a job in college. Uh, but um, the, there's there's some of them that it's workforce and that's that's the only place they're gonna go. They're not gonna go on. So it'd be interesting to me to find that. Another comment that I had, the career education was brought up in your story is exactly that, and, and I think that's what Kansas can is all about. And that is individual plan of study, finding those kids' passion and what those kids want to do, sparking an interest. And I'm really excited. We, we actually hired uh, two high school career teachers, and we're going to have an internship, and we're going to get them out in businesses um, as seniors, and they're going to learn what types of skills they're, they're going to do. Basically, it's not going to be a shadow day. They're going to work. At the, in the career field that they're interested in, went to Seaman High School and, and kind of looked at what they did, and they brought in kids, and all the kids in that program, the 30, 35, most powerful one that stood up and said, I hated my internship, and what I learned is I did not want to go into that technical study. That to me, that's as powerful as somebody that says, Oh, I loved every minute of it because that kid said, you know what, I'm going to go try something else this next semester and see. And so that's the direction I think Kansas can is leading us. And I think that will that will lead us to more of the technical education if you get right down to it. Uh, the third comment is utilizing resources. Um, we actually have been utilizing Hutch for a long, long time. Took a, took a tour, and I highly encourage you of uh, WRC. We took a tour and we're partnering. I'm going to send buses from my two high schools every day, a morning and afternoon bus to take kids over there because we provide more opportunities that I can afford. And guess what? It cost me zero. It's funded by the state, Senate Bill 155, and so I'm providing more opportunities without adding staff in my building. And we're probably we're, it's a 45 minute drive for my kids. So you're closer than we are. The WHEC. The WHEC. And that's out there at the far right. Yes. Yes. Sure, you actually have three campuses. We do. We have three campuses. We have our aviation manufacturing campus on North Web Road. Uh, we have our healthcare campus on 47th Street South and Oliver. And then we have our downtown campus on Grove and Douglas. Uh, that has all of our specialized trades, which is like our uh, automotive, our HVAC, uh, our IT, uh, our uh, uh, carpentry program is all there. And our Southside Center uh, down south has all of our health care programs. And I, and I agree with somebody said something earlier about getting parents involved, whether it's a Hutch, whether it's a WTC, WTC or Washburn Tech. Getting those parents on camp, we have a parents night uh, for Renwick kids, for Renwick families at WATC about a month ago, and uh, went over very, very well. We have parent meetings to discuss 
And WATC came out and presented, let's just come out and present an opportunity. The parents, we had, normally, if, if I'm talking, it's just me, I've got five parents. There were 27 parents there at this meeting with their kids because we presented to the kids first, got them interested, they brought their parents along to see what was going on. And then we had uh, a parents' night so they could see the facility. So high school or middle of Just high school. Just high school. Sherry, Just so uh, Sherry, Tracy said something that I was going to pick up on and ask if you had the same opinion, but he was talking about uh, data in terms of where students go. And what I'm suggesting is that the outcome metrics information that the K Board staff are now collecting might be some of that data that could inform uh, job placement rates starting wages, starting salaries, and also number of graduates in the fields, in the technical fields. Is that, is that something that you would see as valuable information? Did you hear it? Oh, I'm sorry. I, you guys were frozen for a minute. I just get, got you back. I was, what did you I, was, uh, I was picking up on something that Tracy had been talking about related to data. Uh huh. The uh, number of students in programs and that kind of thing. And what I was wondering is if our outcome metrics that K Board is now collecting and reporting wouldn't be a good input uh, as a data tool for this discussion. I think it'd be great data tool. Yeah, I think it would be. I, you know, I think there. I think to your point um, in asking your question, I think it's a great question. How many students take advantage? I would tell you one of the things that we struggle with is students start in high school in SB 155, but getting them to finish after they graduate from high school to go to that job, uh, that conversion rate, so to speak, is it's, it's a tough sled. I mean, it just is. And it shouldn't be. It should just be such a natural next progression. But it's a change of mindset. And uh, it, it starts... Uh, I mean, it takes a lot of people to move that uh, move that mindset because it's parents, it's high school administrators, it's principals, it's counselors, it's students. I mean, it, it, there's a lot of things that have to happen to move that mindset. But for people to understand, like I said in my mind, I keep thinking this is the best way to reduce loan debt for, for students that I could ever think of. Yeah, there there is. Uh a data set called out outcome metrics that keyboard has been collecting for about three or four years now. They're, they're in a position and it's just on the two year sector. So it's Wartburg Tech and all of the two year colleges. Uh, and it, it, it will tell you by career tech at pathway area for degrees and majors, how many are graduating, the starting wages, job placement rates, those kinds of is that a searchable database or? Well, I think it's something you, you might have to just request from Puerto Rican staff. Okay. But they, they share that it's not really information that relates to the universities, it's information that relates to the two year sector that K Board staff report to the Kansas Technical Education Authority to show what kind of results we're getting and also to show which occupations are in demand. Oh, so in the space. Show that. that. Show that. Okay. Yeah, students. Well, and, and, and incorporate into your individual plan of study. Because a lot of it is, okay, you've got to figure out where you want to go. And look, let's be honest, most freshmen, sophomores have no idea what career they want to go into. They may have some interest idea. But you've got to start zeroing in as they get into that junior, senior year and exposing them to the possibilities. Because most of the time, it's not about what's available, it's about what they don't know is available and what they don't know right. in terms of career. Well, and Tracy, our, our unspoken direction for them has been go to college. Right. Well, it's not unlike the kindergarten conversation we have where we have you know, one group that knows 12,000 words, one group that knows 30,000 words, and one group that knows 48,000 words. I'll guarantee you these two folks, their children knew a lot of, about a lot more careers than my kids did. My kids are all yeah. in education. Yeah, I think one of our two, which is great, yeah. 
you know, I, I think about the limitations that we have, and you know, that's the reason I asked you if you involved your middle school kids, because yes, they might not be ready to make that choice yet, right? But to get them out and around <coughs> and see, I didn't realize there was a job in plastics. Well, you know, that sort of thing. But that comes with the individual plan of study and the career. That's got to start in the middle school. Right. We, uh, and here's our problem. Up until this year, we hadn't made a commitment for the career side of the middle school level. And so we, we haven't had, we've never had elementary counseling, ever. We had one social worker that would split four buildings. Well, this year we hired two K-8 um, counselors. And so they're going to really focus on that career side of it. And they're, they're, they're going to, we've been planning to take kids to colleges and, and campuses and visit to those kinds of things. But we've done some very rudimentary level career stuff the last three years with them in our current strategic plan. But we're going to really move that forward. I think the individual plan of study is, is a, and career education at that level is going to be imperative uh, to move forward. I, I will share with you, I'm going to share with these guys the reason, the primary reason we went out to see Sherry was to see, talk to her about our um, uh, career expo and pass that idea by her and then we, we went to speak up. But um, Tracy, you haven't heard this at all before, but on uh, November um, 15th and 16th, we're going to have a two day career expo. And um, Sherry told me that she will have more booths available than Washburn Technical Institute will because <laughs> she's highly competitive and so is Clark. So, um, Steve, it's time for you to pony up. Sounds but like what it. we want to do, just to give you a little history, we were at the CTE conference and Washburn Tech had, I think, max seven booths, but, but they had a hospital bed there with the mannequin. Sherry, you have the same, same things? Yeah. You can give it shots. You know, you can do all the treatments. They had that. They had their culinary arts there. They had a uh, heavy equipment simulator there. And Max and I talked. We said, our high school kids need to be seeing this stuff. We're going to attempt to get every two-year program, every apprenticeship program, and every military option here on those two days, along with businesses, so you can bring your kids to one location and see all of those things. And, and Sherry was very gracious, and they're on board with us. Um, in fact, Steve, I'm sure you have these too, but uh, in the aircraft industry, they have a paint simulator. Um, three microns, do you have that too? Do you have a paint simulator? Well, we don't have uh, aerospace painting, but yeah. we've got other simulators. Welding simulators, I mean, the stuff is amazing that they've got um, robotics that they're gonna bring, uh, her instructors were just all over it. Uh, a combination of robotics and welding program that they have. So that's why we went initially to see Sherry. So hopefully, Tracy, we're going to help you with some of that to have an opportunity where you can see a bunch of stuff at one time. I like to. I, I want to take the conversation back a little bit to where we started because I, I think. This is a conversation that resonates back from Hutchichuco from our visit with Mr. Friesen, my high school principal. We're talking about the stackable credential, and we're trying to identify that we're we're trying to identify this down further and say, what is who is this? Who are the kids we're talking about that we're trying to solve the pro a problem for? And, and I think, I don't know how to say this politically correct, but we believe our 20% that struggle the most, this is probably not the conversation we need to be having. I mean, this may not be the answer for that group, but we believe there's a, there's a big gap in there between the, the 21st percentile and the 60th percentile that really this fits for kids. But I guess one of the questions is, how do we get, we talked about in the beginning general ed requirements. We also talked about this manufacturing skills certificate that's eight credits. 
what do kids have to have to be able to get into phase one of this? And, and what are the areas we can get them in if they're struggling in school? I think that's one of our concerns is there's a lot of good things out there for kids, but we have kids that we can't get into those, into those programs. So where do we start? Or Again, I'm trying to remove some roadblocks. How do we remove some of those roadblocks? Well, What's that look like? I, I'll say, and I'll, I'll do a little bit of a disagreement. I think, I think stackable credentials and technical opportunities are for, that can be for anybody because my four-year kid who wants to be a mechanical engineer can go and get some hands-on practical application level in, in high school that will benefit them moving forward. My two-year... I, I don't disagree. I don't disagree with that. Yeah. And so my two-year person, that's they're, they're going to move forward that way. And even the people, that bottom 20%, they bought my house. You know, <laughs> you, our goal is to give that some, give everybody an opportunity to career and success in, in our society. And I think this type of opportunity can be for everybody if they want to, if they want to take advantage of it. I don't know that, uh, and I maybe didn't. Maybe, maybe I didn't understand your well, and Maybe I didn't catch it right. I'm trying to figure out how do we get some kids involved that maybe don't have the academic skill, academic skill set for them. What's the academic minimum academic skill set for manufacturing skills versus the health allied health side? What? How do those look different? Manufacturing yeah, skills uh, open enrollment. It would be good that if they had a um, uh, work keys reading score that you know was at least at a uh, Bronze. Right. It's not necessarily essential, but it would be good that they, you know, have have a baseline reading ability. That work skill. Uh, say that again. Well, work ready work certificate, like right. work, work ready certificate, specific to the one assessment on reading. It would be good that they at least have a bronze in reading. Okay. Um, but other than that, it's open enrollment, and and you're coming in with the assumption that they don't know anything about the content, and we're going to start here and train them. And Content. And during that time, they're going to they're going to learn how to read blueprints. So you're going to be locating information. They're going to be doing applied math, uh, locating information, precision measurement, things like that. That are going to provide a baseline set of skills that can lead into some of these other uh, technical areas. Steve, is that a kid that's already graduated from high school coming to you, or could a kid in high school start taking those? We're doing this at Bueller High School right now. We're taking two years to do it and we're modularizing it based on what Bueller High School has time to do. So it's really everybody. It's it's post-secondary and, and high school. Some high schools um, have found this harder to adapt because they're they they because of the way they're funded they need to push it under uh, another program pathway that's already there. For me I would say if somebody doesn't have a machine shop put it in your draft program. And and teach it within the drafting areas. All you have to have is instructor buy-in and it can happen. Um, it, it also fits in welding and uh, it's a perfect fit for machining but it, it really um, and like Sherry said earlier we're, our institutions are open enrollment so we're looking at some basic things you know on the on the uh, work keys level but I'm not so sure we would even uh, just allow someone to enroll if they didn't have the score. I would just say that we would prefer that bronze level at least as a minimum to get started. Let, let me ask you and Cherry a question because this thought started rattling around my head and superintendents, former high school principals think about this. If a kid had, uh, I'm gonna say a silver level on the work, uh, work keys, on the math, okay? How many credits do you think that equates to of high school work? That, that makes a kid prepared mathematically for 87% of all jobs. Is that right? Do I have my number right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So they've got the math skills for 87% of all the jobs in America. If a kid got that, now they're not going to just walk in and take that test, are they? They're going to have to have some prep. But instead of saying, we're going to make you take Algebra 1, Geometry Algebra 2, if we did a work keys math preparation, 
and that kid got the silver, do we care how long it took him to get there if that thing is worth, say, the three math credits? That's a really different way of looking at it. Instead of saying you're going to take three courses, you get this level on the work keys map. Is that the equivalent of, and I don't know, do you have any idea, did I ask you a question you've thought about before, or did I catch you cold on this? How many math credits, high school math credits, would a civil, silver level be worth in the work keys map? My, my my response would be, I haven't really thought about that, Steve, but I guess I would say that if you have an adult student that comes in and they do a silver level in math, they're work ready, and they're ready for classes. So, you know, how would that equate back to high school? Well, an adult student, that says, I'm ready to go. I mean, that's, a, that's an entry, that's a gateway that opens for them. And, you know, at, at WATC, we're just exactly like what Steve was describing at Hutch. We're doing these programs, and we don't have the manufacturing skills. We call it Aviation Core. It's the same thing. It's just a little different nomenclature, but we're doing that in the high schools or existing high schools. We're doing it at all of our campuses, and we have high school students being bused to our campuses. Uh, and then you know, we do it for those for graduates as well. So for us, the, the, the math is a proficiency level. It's not about what courses you took. Well, and, and in my mind, that's where I was going, because on the work, uh, work ready certificate is locating information, reading, and math, right? Those are the three. If a kid was at a bronze or a silver, those have to be able to equate to some amount of learning that we could give credit for, but that's a really different approach instead of saying, you gotta take this class, this class, this class. That, does that complicate the issue or does it simplify where the kid now the goal is get this level and you're in? In my mind, it might simplify in this way. It really goes back to games behind you. I, you know, when we talked about the old carpenter thing, we talked about a lot earlier. <coughs> because now you sit there and say, well, they got that, they learned it. Whether you're taking that and you apply that, okay, we can award this credit. They've done the carpentry class. You look at what their test score is on that certificate, and you got that test score, and you say, what do you mean they don't have the math? What do you mean they don't have that? They qualify for 87% of all jobs in America. The, the only thing, Bob, that, that I will come back to, your requirements as a superintendent says, to graduate a student in Kansas, they must have three math credits. Does it, they have to have three offers? Absolutely not. And it, it just says algebraic and geometric concepts need to be in those th three credits. Which were in the... You have a right classes that they get, and they have to if they get the you earn the math credits. You can pretty easily, I think, put it in. They can earn math concurrently with some of the career yep. tech ed, and they will get their math credits if they can show yep. that they have they can earn a silver certificate. And, and I think it's it's not either or. It might be both. That if you get the silver level, you get three math credits, or if you take the class and demonstrate it, you get the math credits. Well, I guess. The only reason I'm thinking maybe that's fitting the system then to walk out, but maybe that's fitting the system if we say they have to have this okay. So but, yeah, and I agree with that. Only on the other hand, the people that want to be on the critical side and say, well, you're not teaching any math, you can't show me any math. Say a minute. Go take the test. Yeah. It's 87% of all jobs in America. And, and Bob, we gave you some of those questions at Soup's Council. They weren't easy. Yeah. So this, I'm, I'm torn between what's next and my lack of knowledge of word keys, this whole concept. I guess, what's everybody's knowledge of that? Just this silver, bronze, silver, and... Yeah. Well, we actually give it. Uh, we have a given fidelity. I mean, it's, it's been one of the things that we put in place and we're not using the scores as well as we should right now, but that's something that we're, we're really wanting to do a better job of. So, so let me ask Sherry and Steve, let me ask you guys this. Who, who are you seeing 
if you were to say, here's a school that's really using this, or do you have any recommendations on how we could better use this tool? Um, I, I'm just curious, are, are you see, I guess, where do you see the importance level of this before we transition over to the kind of some, for me, I've got enough information today now to begin to say, okay, I've got all this information. Um, I'm tired of talking, it's time to do something. I mean, that's where we fall down sometimes. One of the things I'm doing, Kevin, so I interrupted that a little bit, but you started asking me about that. I think that's the training has to go with it. I mean, uh, Annie has it, she works with us, and so it runs up with it in our, our alternative school. But what just went through my mind is, you're doing some great data. I don't know how hard it is, but I, I wanted to say, okay, so I'm just right here at the end of the year. Every one of you are going to take a work sheet and you're just going to see where you fall. And that's some valuable data to say how many of our kids really qualify for these type well, of jobs and are career or college ready. You it's know, even better data if you give it to those freshmen who had pre tests and then take them to senior post. I agree, Tracy, but we haven't been giving it. Right, 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 right. right. I would like to see, and it gives <clears> me a judgment, and I think it gives valuable data to our teachers and to our math teachers and to our other teachers and say, look at our kids, you know, only 50% of them get a silver certificate. We have five or so many that got goals, and we have so many that got problems, we have some that didn't qualify for anything. But that's got to mean something to, to your staff. I don't think they've got to understand yeah. what it is. And, and, and unfortunately, right now, we don't, we don't have a line in my district, but it's something we need to do a better job. Yeah, but does it give us a piece of data to begin to have some different conversations? So I think that's, I, I'm with, I'm with all the conversation here, but what we've got to do is figure out if we don't have the data to show our staff that what we've been doing isn't making a connection and isn't allowing our kids to take the next step, then we're another year away from doing that. I guess a starting point is where I'm thinking right. it does provide some data that I don't think you have to do a whole lot of training and say you have to get by in this. This is a data point. We're going to look at it. I also want to go to the seniors and say, seniors, this is a data point. You guys are about to graduate. It might be interesting for you to know that based upon this test, this industry test, you mm -hmm. qualify for X number of times, you qualify for these, or Slap in the face, you don't qualify for squat, right? Yes. You know, what are you going to do now to your life now? You're about to graduate high school. Right. So, hey, uh, hang on, just Eric. Okay. Hang on just a second. Uh, Bob, part of what prompted this, this conversation and thinking, Max asked one of the instructors at Watson, if I had, how many kids would I have to have to put on a bus in the summer, drive them down to Watson, go through Remington and pick up some kids there for a specific program? I'm not, I don't even remember which it was, was a 10, it was a 10 hour sheet metal. Sheet metal. Okay. Yeah. Sheet metal. And, you know, in our discussion then afterwards, okay, but you don't want to run 45 minutes on a bus to stay there an hour and then turn around and go home. Do a half day or an all day, whatever is required. In the summer, 10 week course, you know, send them down. But then the, the, the question is, could we do that during the school year? And how do you get in the math and the reading and that led to a conversation about maybe it's a math skills class that, that's flexible, focusing on the work keys versus go every day to Algebra 1. You know, it's a scheduling change. And then driving to Watts is a lot different. That bus trip is a lot different for a kid that's there for four or five hours than it is for a kid that's there, you know, has to run out for an hour and turn around and go home, which the most there's on. Right? It just doesn't work, work to do it, to do it, you know. Uh, and we, we actually, some of the pushback we've heard from parents just drives you crazy. It's like, well, I want my kid to drive. Like, we're going to pay for the kid to ride the bus safely, and you don't have to have the wear and tear in your vehicle or put your kid on the road, but the kid wants to drive. So that's frustrating. The other, the other, frust the other two frustrating things is, well, what about sports? You know, how's that going to, how's that going to impact sports? Well, they can't get back in time, or they're going to be penalized. Like, we have to get flexible as a district and as personnel. The third thing that's the most maddening to me is uh, the, uh, the comment of, 
Well, you're going to have to get up a lot earlier to get over there. <laughs> and I'm like, I can't physically move what's he to us. You know, that's the biggest so, issue I think some of us have is location and proximity. Yeah. And some of that's trying to bring bring those programs to our own campuses. For example, Goddard uh, now has a brand new um, auto mechanics auto body shop in their shops. And we're talking about potentially instead of going all the way to to grow, uh, is it Grove campus? Grove, yeah. Campus. Go to Goddard. Of, of, if we've got three or four kids and they've got room, putting them in there instead of sending them all the way to Grove. So it's, it's finding where those resources are and being able to use proximity, which brings up another thing, and that is, and I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, have a huge conversation or offend anybody, but I don't like having to deal with the Board of Regents to get permission to be able to, to access resources for my kids. And I would rather see us all work together as K-12, technical post-secondary, and four-year post-secondary, so I get to choose what's best for my kids, and I can utilize all the resources in my area. You can think back on that just a little bit, too. You just brought up the Goddard thing. Norwich is not very darn far from Goddard. Right. I got a kid, a uh, special ed kid. Not terribly down, but wasn't able to get into that program. It was something with a reading school or something like that. You know how frustrating that was to me because I got excited. When I see a kid that I know can go to their program, we can probably have sent a parent, and he could have been successful even if we didn't need to send a parent. And now, like so many other kids in, and people in Norwich, we're going to be, rather than something where he's going to have a decent paying <clears throat> job, we're back to, well, let's keep it at that low side, or keep your feet. Damn, that made me mad. I mean, it frustrated the hell out of me. What do I need to do? I mean, we had the greatest opportunity in the world, and Governor said, they said, hey, we don't have enough people to fill this. You're right, we'll it take is me. <laughs> and we talked about, I don't even remember the exact reason, but it just all of a sudden came right out. As I he did. could I do it. I they wouldn't let him do it. And he could have been successful, I'm sure. But, yeah, you could have put it in my IEP, but back, what about the kid that's not an exceptional student that just has a low reading level? You know, that, that was what started my conversation this morning with Jane. We've got to make sure our high school kids have the reading skills. They're not going to get that in a traditional English class that's college prep. We don't teach kids to read in those classes. Am I wrong on that? Practice, but there's no teaching. Yet. There's no teaching goes on. But why can't we give English credit for that kid that's learning to read better? Well, high school English teachers struggle with the actual teaching and reading because they don't practice it. They don't yeah. deal with it. Well, that, and it's, and it's, it's tough to elementary teachers, teachers, not to high school English teachers. Right. Steve, Steve, I'm going to have to jump off because I have to go to another meeting. Um, but I, you know, I, I enjoyed the opportunity to participate, and I thank you for the invitation. And um, certainly, we are um, open and ready to work with everybody in any way we can. And if, um, you know, we have blocks of classes at three, you know, three hours a block, uh, if we need to do something more extensive than that, we could look at it. Uh, if we need to physically relocate maybe a couple of days a week into a facility that's more centrally located like Goddard, we could probably work a little more. Or maybe two days a week, they're on site there, three days a week in the labs, I don't know how, what we can do. And we're also doing some things at Mays that might open some opportunities from a locality uh, issue. And then um, you know, we're open to expanding some things at Goddard. They've got some spots that we could expand in if we could figure out what those you know, more necessary areas would be. So I, I, I appreciate the opportunity and uh, certainly stand ready to help in any way we can. I think I'll jump off real quickly, but just a based from what Tracy said, I mean, is it possible to take a class to uh, Goddard, to uh, the aeronautics place, or any one of those three places? If you can get some kids that have interest that 
Because we have a lot of kids be farming and all these other things. You mean like a tour? Talk, what? You mean like a tour? No, I don't well, actually take classes. Talk about taking a class, you do about a three hour block. Oh, we could take and drive a bus over there and get a three hour block for the kids that don't have that job, don't necessarily have the opportunities, but we can work with them to get them something that's something that's really going to help them going into the next school year. Yes, yes. The answer to that would be yes. What we could do is we could offer the core set of classes that are the entry level, the gateway courses into machining, welding, sheet metal assembly, uh, uh, you know, a whole composite, a whole plethora of that. We could offer those classes in a centralized location and come and teach those classes. Uh, and, and we could do that. And then the following semester, then we probably have to put them in the labs here, uh, you know, unless we, you know, that, but we could do that for a semester very easily. I'm talking about From all the entry level. Yeah, so I think you can, you have the ability to maybe put that together. So maybe if, if uh, Tracy and Bob have a, some kind of proposal of what they want, you can maybe work with them to get that to happen. Okay. Yes, yes. Sure, Hutch would do the same thing. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so we'll, we can work with you on that. At least get the gateway courses available for you at closer proximity, yes. Thank you. I know you said you had to run, so thank you. Sherry. Thank you. So I'm going to transition this. I'm going to push. Um, so what – we fall down here every time because we like, we like to talk about all these things, but we fall down on what's next. So the challenge today is what is next. So I think what we've got to do is figure out what it is we want to try to do. So I heard the two of you talk about maybe if you want, you can pick whatever you want to do. Maybe if you want to get together and talk about it. Is there anything you want to share with us before you go? No, just let me know and you can come back. Okay. Steve Banks. Yeah. Steve. Okay. So I think for me it is we have got to get off center and quit talking about some of this and we've got to make some things happen. All right. So this is just this is just what I was hearing is summer school versus year versus school year programs and a collaborative effort. These two to me connect and it connects with what the two of you were just asking about. Um, I have interest in this work piece thing. I need to run that by my principal, and I'm kind of in this limbo transitional stage, so I'm trying to figure out what that all looks you like. Guys, you guys take the ACT with the juniors. You have the, uh, you take the Aspire and the ACT? Do the ACT. Okay. We, uh, two years ago, we started also doing the Aspire, which is the global version of the ACT down in the third grade. We're doing it six, six, through, six through 12 now. Uh, it's, it's a whole package. Four keys is, is a part of that after a 12th grade version of it. Um, so we're taking the ACT uh, and then the, the, the Aspire and work keys. It's a whole product. So, what do you have some data? Do you have any work keys data? We've got a little bit. Um, we haven't, we haven't, I think, like I said, we haven't had great follow through at the building. Um, and so it's been kind of hit and miss with, with getting, getting it implemented. Um, and so that's something that we've got to work on uh, as a priority of our. What data do you need uh, when you ask that? I don't know. We've been giving it for three years. I don't know what to ask you. The work I'm going to you. send you. I'm going to send you the levels and the job opportunity. That I think that's a good starting point. But I think um, would you be? I'll just ask. Would you be willing to? We, is there a way we can lay this data out in front of people and look at it? You know, I don't. Is that don't don't, that's why I'm asking. I don't know if we have a way down that. It's only three years of it. When you're talking thirty kids, you know. You know, we've been doing a long time. Is uh, the first? Yeah, I know. And that, that was part of their whole. Right. So they, they, they may be a resource. So in Hillsboro and Mac, maybe. Uh, but yeah, I'd, I'd have to just see if I can get that information. Yeah, I don't know. The new boss. Yeah. yeah. I am, but uh, it doesn't mean I have it right now. But I probably could, yeah. And um, we have very few bronzes. Uh, never have had a, we have had kids score platinum in a lot of areas, but never enough to make them all platinum. And I mean, we're talking, you know, you all have 34, 35 ACP kids, and they're not scoring platinum on this stuff. A lot of goals. Well, a lot of 
So yes, it would be like 99% of all American jobs. It's, it's uh, reading for information. For it's one of those locating things. information, reading, and math. One's so reading for information and one's located. Right. And there's one of those two, math we just killed. But it's that one, it's that one for the whole state. Jay, Jay and workforce would have that information. Because uh, there's tons of information. The one test knocks everybody down. I can tell you that. So I always go, why are we so poor? And get so Which yes. So so what do we want to do next time? I guess I'm trying to get us um, so what, what is it we want to do next time? Do we want to continue? Do we want to dive in more on this? Or do we want to go to the kindergarten reading side? I'm just trying to figure out, I need some direction because I feel like I'm... I, I'm doing it through, but I, my, my interest today is because we are really focusing on the career piece. And that's this. My, my struggle with the career piece really is envisioning what it looks like at the at the elementary level. And and college career readiness, you know, you talk about it and my first my first thought is it's best secondary. But it really needs to be more of a K-12, you know, sequential <laughs> focus. And I don't know what that looks like at the, at the lower elementary level. I can understand it at the, the six through twelve level pretty easily. But at K five piece, what is college career readiness at K five? Well, that, I mean, that's what Jim said. That's what I think of as well. Because we have you know, two big pieces. I mean, there's going to be time to really need to drill down as we look at different each school in mean, each district. But I'm trying to wrap my head around a lot of what we're talking about. We're doing implementing the third period. We have been some of the other stuff. We're playing with it right now. My mind is there a variety of things we get, but one of them is it's going to be that data people that uh, repository where a lot of the curriculum you do is mentioned in the data that you That gives me some people who are six or eight, but right now just looking at them as well. So that's just a piece. There's a lot of things you got to look at, just like Tracy's talking about. The other part of it is, and that's how you're doing some of this, I think, out there. I don't know what in my own district is kindergarten readiness for our daycare for schools that aren't associated with the school and even with the school, all of those pieces look like and how they really vary those kids and how they be in our elementary teachers think that they wouldn't necessarily even touch that. You know, we talked about that today. They, they very well could. Well, and I, my perception is we didn't plan to study and, and somewhere in the sixth grade, sixth grade day we're going to start, we're going to start that. I don't want to blow people out of the water. My concern is manageable bite-sized pieces of what we can accomplish. But I guess my concern with trying to do both is if you bring kindergarten teachers, you bring a group ready to focus on that topic we didn't even touch the surface of. If you bring a group of people, if that's what they want to talk about, then there's going to be a lot of conversation on that. That is a three-hour conversation. It isn't an hour and a half conversation. And then what do we do with it when we're done? This is a different conversation, but I'm just going to be honest with you. We don't have the right people here to talk about this. I don't think. Either one. Absolutely. Jane cannot be here that day. I know someone who can facilitate the conversation. It's just a matter of if she is able to put it all together. Well, that, it actually worked well for my district because. I've already emailed Vinny and told her about it. She, she's doing the elementary. She, I'm very fortunate. I hired an assistant who understands the elementary side, understands the high school side, and so there's that collaboration. She, I've already emailed her and just asked her if she could be here. So she could be here and and with that that kid, she's a kindergarten teacher too, to, to focus in that room and I can go on the other side. I, my biggest concern is I think we as leaders need to be I think the I think the benefit of, of the conversations we've had is that 
we as leaders need to be in the conversation along the way. I do not believe we're ready to turn. I don't believe you should turn the conversation over. To, and this is just me talking. Right. I don't believe you should turn that conversation over to them yet because I don't think you or I, I'm just speaking from what I'm believing, or any of us in the room have the, have the knowledge base to be able to talk um, coherently about what's over here. And I think from a leadership perspective, if we don't get it, it's not going to happen. We're going to go back to where our strengths are, and kindergarten readiness is going to go. And that's just my take. I, I, I agree. We, we should be in the room. You're not going to be able to accomplish both. But that was my thought. Is, well, we're going to do both. It's two separate rooms. I can't be in both places. So I'm uncomfortable with it because of her strengths and but I agree, I'm never going to gain the knowledge unless I'm sitting in the, and, and being part of that conversation. And I believe right now it's more important that we, the stage we're at, I believe it's more important that we embrace whichever one. I mean, I'm just speaking for myself. I'll be happy to. If the wishes of the group are to go two ways, we can do that. I think the other concern is it's May, whatever the May date is. Yeah, well, you're right and, there, you're right. And here's a, the other question I have is are your teachers going to want to be pulled out of the classroom to come towards the end of the year? I know principals get pretty skittish about being out of the building the last couple of weeks of school. Teachers are sometimes even worse than that, and for sure. You guys have field trips piling up, requests piling up, just like I do. We're at May 11th, which is, uh, we're actually, that could be right at one of the last three or four days. So what we might do at 14, we might call Workforce One and it gives it, it is the test they give. Somebody goes in and tries to get employed. Have them come in, they'd probably be better experts than any. We do have a workforce. Is that in house? I mean, in touch. It's in my person, isn't it? Slime. I was with her yesterday. I mean, that would tell you some about work keys if that's what you want to learn. Well, you have the keys. So, look, Steve and I talked. There's another piece to this. Steve and I talked too about. Our, our last superintendent's meeting is the 25th, and sometimes we, it, it is and isn't well attended, depending on what the topic is. Are we better off to realign that meeting? We could even, we talked about a field trip, I mean, even going to the meeting in Wichita area, just to see more of that program. Is there some benefit in something like that? I think it'd be good. It's cool. And they've got a nice meeting room that they said we could use. We could just come and use it. Well, um, <clears throat> I guess I need to think about this a little bit. And I'll talk, I'll kind of chat around a little bit. What's, what's the, I mean, what's your timeline goal? And you said, I mean, I agree. A lot of times we, we do a lot of talking, but that, that implementation, a really a difficult step, and, and I haven't been there before. So, what's kind of your your long term goal of, of this group's conversation? The intent is to do something. So, I guess my thinking is whatever we do next time is that we say you, you need to. I, I think that the beauty of doing it toward the end of May is you can bring some administrators and you can have some conversations about what are we going to do. Um, but I think we need to have some information that. Um, need a critical question or a call to action or whatever that says, as a result of today, here's one thing we're going to do. And then, I understand exactly what you're saying. If I'm leading this room, I already told you, I'm going to start having that conversation with this afternoon. What do I need to implement with you? Do I have a conversation, conversation with my team in high school principal? Find that in order to say, we have a conversation with us to this room. I want to know, yes, you're about to hear the location. I've got a test that will give you a pretty good idea of how this is. I just want to know the data. You can look at the individual school. Give it your best shot. Would you be interested in doing it? You know, and that gives me 
things to do, let's do it yourself. I mean, I've got a group that uh, they can go on at WATC. I've got kids that come down England that are some of them are the best students in school, and these are the ones we want to get jobs in the future. Can I figure out a way to have conversations with their parents now about taking a bus, like and that's Tracy's idea, and getting over to WATC or up to Hutch for three hours and say, this is for getting a certificate that's going to get you a job and make you some money in the future. I mean, those are things I think, those are solid things that we can start trying and see what happens. Um, we were shocked at the openness of the of the post-secondary institutions to customize and say, what do you want? We'll figure it out. Steve, Jerry, Clark, all of them. My suggestion would be maybe we would go after schools that are in late May. I would stay with us having a couple of different groups so I understand the need to be involved, but it's not like this open any conversation. There, yeah, I, I get that, but I, I think in part, you know, it's kind of catching our people up, and getting them to start thinking differently. We're doing that, but we've met what three or four times, and we're nowhere near. Them. But I think just having a venue for them to come together and have that conversation, we can take one or go between. That would be my suggestion. Just make it available, make this conversation available with more people in our district. I agree with James, and I'll tell you, I think that we've got to do, I think we've got to wait till high school principals can be here too. They're so critical, and they never, they can't get out of the building. That's really hard. They're way behind in this conversation in most places. And so are the teachers. And we have some late starts. And you know, talking about some, I mean, I know Florida was on there. What, what have you been doing? Well, on during late starts, there's only one of them. And Max helps out too. So he happened to have a great conversation with our elementary teachers. He didn't even set this up ahead of time. He wants to get in elementary. I go to junior high school and we start having this conversation. An example of where they're behind. You know, one of the teachers says, Well, we have to do this because if our kids decide they want to get a degree, they can't get a degree if they, you know, do a general prep stuff. And they were talking about, you know, Going to Juco. I said, you're not right on that. I said, you know, if they go to junior college, that's one of the facts. If they go to junior college, they get an associate degree, guess what? They're eligible for the Board of Regents schools right now. They can go. And in addition to that, they might have a certificate. They might have a job right now. And they actually have income. But that, you know, that was like a huge aha moment for I'd say 90% of the staff is on board. Yeah. You know, uh, we, uh, and not that we did it perfect or right, but it was interesting because I had a lot of teachers when they found out.